Good morning. So today I want to share with you some of the work that we're doing with Spark and in particular with the Databricks platform and combining it with a graph database to help combat credit card application fraud. So to give you some context and then go into the component parts and architecture review, hopefully a successful demo, and then some performance metrics on the solution, wanted to uh, start by just talking about the impact of fraud, not only to the cost of uh, banks in the United States, but also the impact to Americans and around identity theft. So you see here, all the data that I'll be showing you today is publicly available. I'm providing the resources down at the bottom of each of the slides. You're seeing that the trend for the cost of, of credit card fraud is incredible. It's uh, nearly you know, $20 million per year. Uh, the introduction of the EMV chip has reduced that for card present transactions quite a bit. But as you see as we go through this, uh, it impacts many millions of people each year in the United States. Uh, so last year, or two years ago rather, uh, $16 billion was uh, stolen in effect by fraudsters from 12.7 million U.S. consumers. And if you take a look at the two types of fraud that I'll be talking about or that the prototype that I'll show you is, is going to be guarding against, uh, we're looking at both application fraud and account takeover. So application fraud is the notion where uh, either somebody creates a wholly synthetic ID, which is actually in occurring more and more frequently, they get that synthetic ID injected into the bureaus, they basically build up a fake credit history, uh, and then they start to uh, monetize the accounts that they're able to. So they'll get a credit card shipped to them, uh, they'll monetize it, they'll never pay it down, uh, they'll apply for a credit card at a different bank, they'll get that card shipped to them, and, and it's very cyclical. Uh, but if you look at the graph here, 45% of the credit card transactions uh, are still card not present. So these are online transactions where the EMV chip isn't a safeguard for the consumer. And then if you look at account takeover concept, it's basically the idea where you would gather information about somebody, either a neighbor or you're casing a street, for example, and you're collecting information out of their mailbox or out of their trash, and you're, you're building up sort of the personal credentials to masquerade as that person. <clears throat> You'd call into the call center, for example, and, and request a new card, say that your card was lost, and ask that that card be shipped to a different address. So there are a series of what we're describing as world-class, real-time fraud defenses that we're trying to create. And some of them are required by law for banks. So the KYC and the AML work, you know, KYC is regulatory requirements around knowing your customer, being able to definitively say who a customer is when they apply and when they transact. Uh, Anti-money laundering, as you might expect, is just uh, paying attention to money movement between accounts and reporting those that exceed a certain threshold. But the, but the fraud component, uh, as I mentioned, has those key attack vectors where you've got either stolen identity or synthetic IDs, both of which generate a brand new account or the hijacked account use case that I talked about. So let's talk about the goals of what we're really striving to do. I mean, to reduce our investigative costs and we want to be able to help customers uh, with identity theft or protecting them against identity theft. So now with Spark and with big data in general, we're able to combine more data from more sources, both the data that's provided by the applicant, but then you combine that information with data that is provided by the credit bureaus, internal data that's collected at Capital One uh, in other third parties as fraud or not fraud as quickly as possible. Again, keep in mind the goal is we want to try to get to a point where we are scoring that and have a reliable score prior to shipping that plastic out to the, to the individual. Uh, this third bullet here is a really important one for us at Capital One and I'm sure for many organizations and it is the, you know, trying to reduce the impedance mismatch between going from one data warehousing environment, for example, and then going into, say, an analytic environment, going into a real-time operational environment, and then, for example, a case management or loss mitigation environment. And so moving data between systems, uh, training users on how to interact with that data, ETLing the data is a very expensive and time-consuming process. And so if you're trying to do things quickly and smartly, the more that you can 
concentrate or consolidate onto one platform and make that platform available for many different personas is really important. So we are excited about Spark. We're excited about Databricks in particular with the notebook solution to pro provide that unified platform for data scientists, data engineers, business analysts, all with the varying, you know, varying degrees of technical skills in terms of programming capability. So we combine this, the historical data, which we would you know, deem as fa uh, big data, with the streaming data for a new application or a new credit card transaction and be able to combine those two in a very powerful way to, uh, to make fraud detections. So let me talk a little bit about the component parts. So we started out with Databricks. We're at a Databricks conference. I won't go through all the bullets on each of these next two slides, but the idea that we can use one platform and plug in a third-party application for, in this example, is a, an open source tool called Vasalo. Uh, we're able to have analysts work within different notebooks, share those notebooks, schedule those notebooks to run on a periodic basis, and be able to let people use the programming language of their choice and the query language of their choice. So whether it's a SQL query or a graph query, uh, we're, we're provided that. The, the nice thing is also we're able to score these applications in real time using the machine learning libraries within Spark uh, as soon as we determine the connectedness of an application. So once an app arrives at Capital One, we can determine what attributes and what features make up that application and determine if it's connected to other applications that have come in or historical apps uh, that, you know, maybe someone has charged off that card and, and they, they got a credit card from us, they transacted with no intention of ever paying it off, they, they abandon the card, we, we write down the losses and they move on to the next bank and, and hope to do the same. So Vasalo is an open source graph database. So the reason why we combine these two is because we found, you know, with, with Spark, it's an in-memory solution, it's immutable. We needed a system of record where we could go through and we could uh, analyze potential fraud networks, see how they might be related in terms of attributes that overlap or geospatial uh, overlap for applications that are coming in if somebody's casing a street. And I'll show you an example in the demo. Uh, have the ability to do fr uh, full CRUD-based work against that data set. So sometimes the data is incorrect, you need, to, you need to correct it. But we also need fine-grained access control. So somebody that is analyzing this data set and trying to determine whether or not a, a customer is eligible for, say, a credit line increase, might need to know just the history of their transactions in terms of amounts, how often they pay their, their balance down, and you know, effectively, are they a good customer or not. They don't need to know the details of an individual transaction, and so we can lock down those details at a very fine-grained level, whether it's uh, attributes on an entity or attributes uh, and the existence of an edge connection. So here you see on the, uh, the right-hand side uh, the integration of the graph and showing it up, you know, having it show up inside of a Databricks notebook. Uh, we do have the ability to export data from the graph, uh, from, from the uh, graph store as RDDs into Databricks directly so that we can do computations and then obviously use the uh, solution for case management. So let me talk a little bit about the data that we, we use to, to build the prototype that I'm going to show you here. Obviously, we couldn't use real customer data, and as many of you know who build applications, generating realistic fake data for your application development and uh, you know, testing is, is a big, big challenge. So we hopefully did some, some creative things here. Everything is machine generated. There shouldn't be any real overlap with an existing person, but if there is, it's, it's certainly not uh, intended. But so we, we wanted there are certain rules by the Social Security Administration for what your Social Security numbers look like and how they got distributed. Uh, mailing addresses, we took shape files and figured out street address ranges and things like that. We took Census Bureau data to generate both your given name and your surname, uh, and then realistic phone numbers based on geolocations for how area codes are doled out. So a lot of, a lot of work went into just generating the data, uh, and the visitor ID is a combination of things that I won't get into too many details, but basically the idea of where is that application coming in from, what type of device, and uh, what, what, uh, what system. So. We generated uh, lots of data for this demo. We only are using six million records that we created, but we uh, built the data. We injected some intentional fraud in it just to demonstrate the actual training of the model, and uh, then we'll stream in some new applications. But uh, we read in the historical data. We went through a series of steps, and I'll show this to you here in a notebook, uh, where we let me come over here and get that loaded up while it, so we can keep the main slide up uh, while I do this, please.
Okay, so I won't walk you through the slide. If we could switch over to the actual Databricks notebook, that'd be great. Okay. So I won't walk you through all the code, and I'm certainly not going to execute this because this is loading the 6 million records. I'll give you some performance characteristics, but we'll run out of time. Uh, it's only a few minutes long, but we'll still run out of time before we get through all the other pieces of the demo. But, you know, basically, we, we have a path to the historical data. We have a path to the model. We're using Parquet as the file format. We've got a helper function here that uh, basically takes the, uh, the pieces of an address and concatenates them into a single address. And then here's, you know, I won't go through all the records, but here's a list of fake records. So if anyone's name shows up or social shows up, it's uh, completely by chance. Um, we'll create the vertex and edge for the data frames, and then we'll uh, go ahead and create the graph frame, and then we're basically computing features for the graph. So in this model, it's very simplistic. The real models, obviously, are much more sophisticated than this, but this is basically looking at how connected are applications based on overlaps between attributes, uh, SSN reuse, email reuse, cell phone number reuse, and you might not be surprised to learn that fraudsters sometimes will just, you know, they'll use the same email, email address over and over again uh, so that they don't have to create, you know, multiple email addresses and check different accounts. Sure. Is that a little bit better? OK. Thank you. So that's, that's extracting the features. The next thing that we're doing is actually taking a look at each individual application and how it is connected to the various parts of the network. Uh, and then we take a look at a Boolean value for historical fraud. So applications that have uh, been in the system for some time and have been detected as being fraud through one, one means or another are labeled as fraud. That helps identify uh, what connectedness attributes help train the model. We then go through and train the model and go out and list out whether or not, you know, we're using a uh, logistic regression model, so it's basically a binary solution of is it fraud or is it not? Then we save the file off to, or save the model off to the, the Databricks uh, system. So once we go beyond that, let me, uh, if we can switch back over to the slides. So here's generally what we're seeing. So the first thing is there's applications. The historical loading of the applications takes some time, but it's a one-time cost. Uh, so we're not too terribly concerned about that, and we can, we can scale it out linearly and, and have it execute pretty quickly. But as applications come in, and I won't get into the numbers, but we've got many thousands of applications that come in per day. Uh, we insert those into Vasalo, uh, which is the graph database. It's using Accumulo under the covers and Elasticsearch to index the attributes. And then we determine immediately whether or not they're connected to one or more existing rings. Sometimes a new application will come in and it'll, com it'll connect to multiple rings, and then you go through the process of merging those rings. Once we can compute the connectedness, we expose that via an API, a RESTful API, and then we've got some exploratory analytics and case management. But we shift over then to Databricks, and we stream those, those new applications into the cluster. They'll, uh, the Solo connector will invoke in real time the, the Vasalo API to get the connectedness, and then we score the application using that uh, logistic regression model that we just showed you, and then identify sort of round trip back. So let me, let me give you an example of what we're looking at here. If we can switch back over to... So this one I'm actually going to run. So cross your fingers for me. Um, and don't blink, because it'll be done. So I'm told that if I hover over this, it'll tell you that we just ran that at 9.56. So looks like it's run successfully. If I scroll down, uh, down to the end result, you'll see that of the 25 new apps that came in, we're identifying three as potentially fraudulent. And let me just show you a quick integration. We can then go in and we can take a look at what that fraud ring might look like. Um, and let me go ahead and scroll over. So if I go ahead and open that up, 
I'll come in, I can, I can get a quick histogram of different information about this particular ring. This is a small one. I'll show you an example of another one here in just a second. But what you can see is, you can see you know, that there are two separate email addresses, uh, and you're, you're basically looking for the overlap. And what you can see in the diagram here is that the cell phone is, is the common identifier. And so it is attached, so an application has come in, it's attached to a uh, prior application that has been identified as fraudulent, and it's combined with a, with a cell phone there. If I go in and just give you a little bit of a uh, notion of a dashboard here, uh, there are dashboard capabilities in Databricks, and you know, that all is, is, is fantastic. Um, we've got some built-in capabilities. So to give you some sense of the amount of data that's in the system, we've got six million applications that are in this system. You'll see a distribution of applications that have come in from around the Washington, D.C. area. I could click on one of these. No, I'm sorry, not one of those, but I could click on one of these, and I can immediately give you a list and be able to interrogate some of these. I won't go through all the different metrics here, but here's, uh, here's including a, a page rank capability from Databricks and, and showing that in the dashboard so that you could see which of the applications are most connected. And then if I come over to a graph here, I can show you two new applications that have come in, uh, some existing fraud. Uh, this would be where in a case management approach where you would identify these things and start interrogating them and looking looking at different attributes about the different applications, or going in and taking a look at a map and understanding that you've got applications coming in from a particular area. We can zoom in. And so this is a potential case of where somebody has applied for, applica applied for credit cards from a series of addresses that are within walking distance of one another. They'll wait for the mail to get delivered. They'll hopefully recover the card before the actual homeowner uh, determines that they've been, you know, been used as, a, uh, as part of a fraud ring. So let me go on and uh, switch back to the slides here. So some performance metrics. Spark and the Databricks platform have really made it super fast for us to do this computation. So if you look at these, these are relatively small clusters. Uh, six million uh, applications that have come in. We streamed in 25 new ones. Ingesting those six million into Databricks literally took less than five minutes. Uh, scoring, uh, doing the model training rather, took less than five minutes. And then the scoring time when a new application came in to determine its connectedness and its potential fraud took less than 100 milliseconds. So uh, with Vasalo, same sort of same sort of thing, we're using uh, Accumulo on top of Hadoop and uh, Elasticsearch, both of which are very fast. And so ingesting those six million records took a couple of hours, but then any time you ingest a brand new record to determine its fully connectedness, you know, its full level of connectedness, rather, to the six million other uh, applications that exist takes about 200 milliseconds per app. So a big thank you. Uh, Richard is here, right here in the front row. Uh, I cannot say enough about the expertise at Databricks in helping Capital One with doing a better job of using Spark, doing a better job of uh, machine learning. And uh, we've got a couple other folks that were on the team. So a very small team doing a pretty quick prototype. So appreciate all the hard work that went into it. But Saurabh Gupta from Capital One and Matt Wiseman from the Vasalo team. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.